wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged podcast, episode 81, Insomnia and Social Isolation, We're Afraid to Be Alone. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Sleep Unplugged, Unplugged podcast. My name is Chris Winter. I'm a sleep specialist and neurologist and your host for the podcast. If you're new to the podcast, welcome especially since you're, this is the first podcast I guess you're listening to in 2024, although there was a mix-up last week. Last week's episode was technically the first of 2024, even though I recorded it in 2023. So for aficionados of the show, last week should have been, since it's the first Monday of the month and the year, um, we do first Mondays of every month are always a topic about insomnia. And I guess you could say weightlifting to improve sleep, including people who have insomnia, but I kind of screwed up. So last week should have been this week and this week, last week. So this week, our, we're doing our first Monday of the month, even though it's the second Monday of the month, as an Insomnia Monday, and our topic is insomnia and social isolation. If you're interested in getting in touch with me or getting in touch with the show, you can do, th do so through my social media. DR Chris Winter Twitter, DR Chris Winter Instagram, DR Chris Winter TikTok threads, Blue Sky. We have a Sleep Unplugged YouTube page where we upload all the videos uh, of the podcast that we post. You can actually watch me record the episode on YouTube and certainly interact through that portal as well too. We always start shows off with comments, corrections, criticisms. I want to read a comment from Barbara who wrote, I'm a recent listener to your podcast and wanted to say a huge thank you for your episodes on narcolepsy. I was diagnosed with narcolepsy a few years ago. And although I'm lucky to have an incredible sleep doc in Melbourne, Australia, and a sleep psychologist, that sounds like a great idea. I still struggle with this invisible disorder and explaining to my family and friends that I just can't push through my sleepiness at times. Your narcolepsy episode made me feel seen and heard, and I will be sharing it with my family and friends in the hopes that they can gain a greater understanding into this disability. Thank you again. Now I'm off to have a nap. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was extremely kind of you. I appreciate you taking the time to write the show. We appreciate all feedback, positive and negative. If I've said something that's wrong or something you disagree with, please get in touch with me and talk to us. We don't, we, we love to, to feature comments from people who are saying positive things and helpful things and, and supportive things, but we certainly want to keep our content free of errors. So if I've made a mistake or something you disagree with, please write in. We'd, we'd love to talk about it. So the quickly to talk about the music of the show and, and at the beginning of every show, we always talk about some song. It's always in the lyric or in the title of this, uh, of the podcast this week, where the, the, the lyric we're afraid to be alone is actually from a John Lennon song isolation. We've done the Beatles back in episode 55. The title was I'm so tired. Of course, the Beatles eventually split up. John Leno, John Lennon had enough of Paul McCartney and I think vice versa. And they kind of went their own way. Towards the end of the dissolution of the Beatles, John Lennon and Yoko Ono were sort of recording some experimental albums. It was like the, the two virgins and then it's like experimental album number two. And I think the third one was something like the wedding, the wedding album or something. I might be getting that wrong. But then he he sort of came back with his first real studio album. So John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band was considered John Lennon's first debut album, fully formed album after leaving the Beatles. And track uh, Mother was the really on the only real single that came from the, the album. I think Working Class Hero was on that album. I think that was on side one. But the last track of side one of the album was isolation and of course john lennon was dealing with wrestling with massive popularity but feeling completely alone isolated felt like he had no friends the people he was closest to he was leaving in terms of the beatles 
And this is an interesting album. It was recorded by Phil Spector, I mean, or produced by Phil Spector, who produced Instant Karma, which was a single that came out in the same year this album came out, 1970, that again was sort of recorded in that transitional period. And I think it was the fastest recorded to release single at the time. I think it took a week and between recording and releasing it to the public was out in a week. And he pulled Phil Spector in to help produce this album as well, too. So this was an album that was not particularly well received by critics when it first came out. It's the Primal Scream album, as people call it. But I think looking back on it, people really feel like it was a very important work and probably John Lennon's best solo work, even though I'm particular to Double Fantasy, the last album he recorded before he was was murdered. Um John Lennon actually calls this album, he called it Sergeant Lennon because he referred to Sergeant Pepper that this was a premier album that he had worked on. And the album also features Billy Preston, who was the keyboard player who played on Sticky Fingers and Black and Blue and Exile on Main Street, Rolling Stones albums, which I think are at the top of my list of favorites. So we'll put on here isolation by john lennon and feature john lennon now on the spotify sleep unplugged music playlist so this is an interesting concept that came to me i've been thinking about this a long time as a clinician who deals with insomnia one of the more difficult things that we deal with is an individual saying, okay, I go to bed, it takes me hour and hours and hours to fall asleep. It's hard for me to stay asleep through the night. And then, you know, I'm waking up much earlier than I want to. And that always leads to a discussion of let's, well, let's talk about your schedule. When do you go to bed? When do you wake up? Is there consistency? Are you seeking too much sleep? Are you giving yourself too little time to sleep? And one of those conversations often is, well, I go to bed early and I sleep in late because I don't have anything else that I really want to do. And I don't think this individual is necessarily depressed. They're just not, they don't have enough to do to fill the hours of the day. And I was talking to a good friend of mine, Melanie, um, who is in charge of the senior center Um in Charlottesville, Virginia, I think it's called the Center. Um, yeah, it's called the Center at Belvedere. And you should look that up. And uh, if you have some money lying around, you want to send it to a great place. It's a nonprofit to create healthy aging opportunities for people who live in Charlottesville, which is my uh, what I consider my hometown. And we were talking about in that senior population how there can be problems with individuals just not having that much to do. And if you combine that with maybe limited vision or poor hearing or other so, you know, impairments, it might make it difficult for an individual to have things in order to fill their time. You know, when you're young and you've got kids in an intense job, all you wish for are extra hours in the day, right? And the flip side, the opposite end of that spectrum, I have patients who are like, look, I watch Wheel of Fortune and then I go to bed. I just, I'm sort of done with the day. I don't, I live by myself. I've got nobody to go out with and see a movie or do something with, get some food, go bowling, walk around the downtown mall, whatever you've got. I, I don't have that support. So I just go to bed and then there's struggle. And as I was talking to Melanie, she said, D have you ever read uh, the Surgeon General's report on loneliness and isolation? And I admitted I hadn't. I said, no, you know, it's interesting. I was out at the Aspen Ideas Conference this year, and I was at the Aspen Ideas Conference that was devoted to health. And Vivek Murthy, Dr. Vic McMur Vivek Murthy, who is the Surgeon General, actually spoke. So there's all these cool venues. It's like this, it's like a little college campus out at Aspen Ideas. And there's tents and permanent venues and book stands of the off people who were there. Like my books were there, which was really cool. My book was right next to 
a comedian's book that I really like, and I'm blanking on her name right now. She's amazing. Um, but anyway, also all these people have interesting ideas about health and their platforms and and speakers going on. It's it's like a concert festival. You got to get your program. Like, okay, we're going to hear the Vex speak. And I want to go talk to this guy who created this really cool new kind of wheelchair and it's going to revolutionize everything. And, and so you kind of go around playing your day. And so I spoke and then right after I spoke and, and I think the biggest venue there, which was shocking, the Vex spoke. And so I got to meet him just briefly. Um, and he's fantastic. But I admitted to Melanie, no, I didn't read what he was there to talk about. He was there to talk about the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. So in 2023, he wrote about the effects of social connection and community on our health. And it's like an 82 page document with two or 300 references. And I read it and it was really fascinating. And even though it only references sleep a few times, it talks a lot about the relationship between social isolation and health. And I thought, wow, this would be a really cool topic for the Sleep Unplugged podcast and something a little bit different and how social isolation and loneliness relates to sleep and specifically for today's talk insomnia, although there's not a lot of scholarship about it. So I thought a lot about this topic over the holidays. This has been some, this has been brewing for a couple of weeks. And I thought a lot about it as my kids started coming back from college and grad school and, and were down here with me. And my daughter who produces this show was down and she's like, oh my God, I can't believe you mentioned Jackie and Wilson because, you know, in the last podcast and she was talking about how that was so cool that she heard that song and I heard the song. And we both came to each other and said, oh my God, I've got a great song for you. She said, it's so funny, I've got a great song for you too. And it was Jackie and Wilson. I think it was before the Hosier album even came out. We had found it on some you know, streaming platform. And so she's there and my son Tice is there, and Rome's there. And then Cam's there, my youngest is there. And I'm wearing a shirt he got me. It's a bar up in Burlington called Rasputin's that he likes to go to with his friends. And my son at the Naval Academy has got incredibly close friends and they're all going to be pilots and they're all going to you know, go down to Pensacola and, and train down there together. And I was just, just in the social connections, my daughter's making at Columbia University with her fellow grad students and her professors and the friend group she has up there. It was just this cacophony of social connection, connection. And it's great as a parent to hear it. And if you're a parent who has a child that doesn't have that, I can imagine that must be really hard. And if you're an individual who's not a parent, who's not socially connected, I imagine it's difficult. And there's some people who may feel like they like it. But when we look at this report by Dr. Murthy, it, it's really striking how this is evolving and what it's doing to our health and, and specifically our sleep. So let's, let's create a couple definitions here. What is social isolation and what is loneliness? So these are two very different things in my opinion. Loneliness is a subjective distress that's being experienced because of isolation or perceived isolation or inadequate meaningful connections. The person who seems to know everybody but might feel incredibly lonely because he doesn't feel or they don't feel like they have adequate connections with anyone. And so there's a need for more connection that's not being met and this results in the feeling of being lonely. Social isolation is more of an objective term. It's objectively having too few social relationships, social roles, group memberships, and basically infrequent social interaction. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I thought a lot about this as a topic for the podcast. I thought a lot about it myself. There's, there's a... There's a joke in my family um, 
I'm going to shout out a great person. His name's Chris Moore. He he's a nutritionist and uh, has his own company called More Results. Does work for Men's Health. Literally does work around the world. And the guy is a superstar. And I, I've gotten to know him because we've done some talks in similar places. And he actually comes to Charlottesville about once a month and does a talk for federal executive, you know, people and and really trains them about proper ways to manage their health and nutrition. And you know, sometimes we work out together. And the joke in my family is, you know, when I what'd you do today? Oh, Chris is in town. You know, we went out to we went out to work out, and he's going back to his hotel. I don't think we're going to get something to eat tonight. So my kids would be like, "Oh, your friend's in town," implying that Chris is my only friend. Um, and so yeah, you do think about, you know, who do you have connections with like that? Who are you going out to see? Who do you go out to have dinner with? And do you have an adequate number of those things? And with COVID, this really got on people's radar because suddenly all the things that we did to be connected were kind of gone. School gone, extracurricular activities gone, sports gone, work, work from home if you work at all, restaurant closed. Bars closed, shopping closed, sporting events done. So it was a really interesting time. And I think that highlighted a trend that was happening even before COVID. And I think by the time COVID was kind of reaching its end, if it's ever ended, I guess the end of the isolation, the end of the social distancing, we were all feeling that. Just, oh, I just want to go somewhere. I want to be around people. And didn't you think that was an interesting, you know, when we were in the thick of it, I mean, everybody knew friends that were doing what we thought were dangerous things, you know, oh my gosh, like they're just having a party over there. I remember when the Dodgers won the World Series, which was great because I worked for the Dodgers, Justin Turner came out of the dugout. He was, he had COVID. He's like, screw this. I'm going to take a picture with my team. <laughs> there he was. Like, what are they going to do to me? Put me in COVID jail? Like he just... Like, what a great, I'm not going to be socially isolated from my brothers when we've just won the first World Series since Kirk Gibson hit the home run, heard around the world kind of thing. So I, I think that we've talked a lot about it. Who is at risk for this? And, you know, risk really differs based upon demographics and, and geography and age, but there are some things from this report that do indicate or lead to a higher likelihood of a person being socially isolated and, and lonely and their physical and mental health being poor, disabilities, financial insecurity, people who live alone, single parents, as well as younger and older populations. And I would probably throw in their caregivers. I mean, that's something that I always talk to my patients about. If you're a patient coming in to have your CPAP checked and you're the caregiver of somebody with dementia, we're going to talk about what are you doing to make sure you're getting out, you're doing the things you like to do, you're still staying and socially engaged because when you're the caregiver of somebody with dementia, it can be very difficult. So I think it's really important to understand as a clinician, when I see a patient, who are, who of my patients in general are more at risk for social isolation? Because if they're socially isolated, they are definitely more at risk for having sleep concerns and sleep problems. And we see this a lot. I mean, there is a certain general type of person that has lots of different conditions. You know, I don't see a lot of insomnia from individuals who are well-connected, busy, jet-setting around the world. I mean, they're exhausted, right? They're always going out. They're always doing things with people. Their risk of having insomnia is going to be much lower. And one of the things that's really interesting is this social connection plays a huge role in our sleep and a huge role in our health. According to the Surgeon General's report, social connection, if you're really socially connected, and I've got friends who every time I look at their Facebook or their you know, Instagram feeds, they're off. They're 
uh, going to visit their friend from nursing school uh, who they see once a year to go to some you know NFL game. And that's how they stay connected. And then they're jet setting across the country to meet up with their Peace Corps buddies. And then they're in class, they're doing classes in their graduate degree, and they're with those people. And then they've got their friends from hometown. They got their work. For, I mean, you're like, wow, super socially connected. And there's their their social connectivity is increasing their odds of survival by 50%. 50% odds of survival increase just by being socially connected. And when you start going down the list of reasons why they're they're truly endless. I mean, think about the individual who let's go through the risk factors of social isolation and look at the opposite. You're individuals with great physical and mental health. So you're in the gym and you're exercising, you're taking care of your body. You know, going back to people in the gym. We talked about last week on the episode, if you're working out and lifting weights, you're less likely to have sleep problems than if you're not. Okay, well, there you go. People with disabilities, probably somewhat of the same thing, especially with significant medical disabilities, obviously is going to increase or decrease survival odds. Financial security, you can pay for good food. You don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from. It's good quality. You've got access to great medical care. You've got access to all kinds of things that are going to create positivity and health in your world. You don't live alone. So if you're having trouble if you're, with your health, you're choking, like there's somebody there to kind of help you. I always worry when I'm by myself and screwing around on a ladder. Like if I fell, nobody's here to, to help me out. It's kind of, kind of scary. And as I get older, like, like as I get older, my confidence with the ladder, there's an inverse relationship with ladder confidence as I get older. Um, so again, so we can explore and you can imagine why there's, this is, shouldn't be any kind of big shock. One of the biggest things that really came out of the, the the report that I found profoundly interesting was internet use. I'm going to read you a little bit from this, which I found fascinating. So nearly all teens and adults under 65 and 75% of adults 65 and over say they use the internet. 85, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Americans spend an average of six hours per day on digital media. One in three U.S. adults, 18 and over, report they are online almost constantly. And the percentage of teens ages 3 to 17 who say they are almost constantly online has doubled since 2015. You know, I, I when I look at, at my kids, when they come home, they were just home from grad, the phone is a thing. It, it's a much bigger part of their lives than mine. My mother-in-law texted me and, and I didn't notice it until the next day. And I realized, wow, she texted me last night at 10 p.m. It's 10 a.m. I haven't looked at my phone in 12 hours. I, mean, I really try to have long periods of time away from my phone. You know, do my phone work, post some social media thing, and then be done with it. Be away from it. And I think that internet use can sometimes foster connectivity, but it can also create a sense of connectiveness when there is none. So how does this interconnectedness, how does social isolation affect our health? And now we're getting into sleep. So they kind of divide it into three categories. There is the biology, there is psychology, and then there is behavior. And so under biology, they feel the thought was that social isolation increases stress, inflammation, and the expression of certain genes, which is really interesting. And something we've talked about with sleep, that when you're, you know, we can be predisposed to have bad sleep, but if we do all the things correctly, we can sort of overcome some of these genetic predispositions. And we see that in, in general neurology as well, too. You have the genes for Alzheimer's disease, yet you do not express them because of certain healthier behaviors that you're engaged in, exercise, eating well, etc. Uh, psychology, they put under their uh, safety, resilience, and hopefulness. And then in behavior, activity to exercise, nutrition, sleep, and smoking. So how does social isolation affects sleep. 
So several studies have found that higher levels of perceived social support, sometimes it's referred to as PSS, an individual's subjective construct of how much support is available to them, that's PSS, perceived social support. I feel like I've got a ton of social support. You know, other people don't. And I can imagine that's a very unsettling feeling. But the people who have more perceived social support, it predicts much better sleep quality and lower incidence of insomnia. And that was from research from 2010. Um, and, and Wendy Troxell did a study in 2007. And so there is evidence that shows that individuals who have that sort of social support actually do tend to, to sleep and do better. Um, there was another study that I found, and this was referred to uh, in in the um, in, in in some some research I was doing. It was called social support and sleep, a meta analysis. This was from uh, Health Psychology in May of 2018. It was a literature review of 61 studies and basically indicated that virtually across the board, even though it was, you know, each study was powered differently, that social support improved sleep quality, really without question. Um, and there's lots of reasons why that might be. One of the, uh, the more interesting theories that I see is something we, that's often called the buffering hypothesis which was pr proposed by Cohen and Willis in, in 1985, which holds that social support decreases the detrimental impact of stress on physical health. That we've got a way to sort of disperse stress when we can share it with other people. I'm really worried about my taxes this year. Well, don't be, because I got a buddy who does taxes. Here, I'll have him give you a call. There, like that friend just helped to alleviate a stress that I had. You know, I, like I, I've said in other podcasts, I spend some time in Sarasota, Florida, because my wife works for the Ringling Art Museum, which is an amazing art museum. If you if you want to go and feel de-stressed. Just spend some time on that 66 acre beautiful campus. And when we're down here, you know, we've got neighbors in Charlottesville that are amazing. We've got we've moved in down here. It's like, I wonder what the people here, they're amazing too. So I feel like no matter where I'm at, I'm surrounded by people who my, my neighbor Dave's checking on my pipes in Charlottesville during a big winter storm, making sure that, you know, the thermostat's okay and the water's turned off and you know, things are doing okay. And I, that alleviated a tremendous amount of stress when I saw that this big storm was coming. You know, so having people around you to sort of carry the load, I think is so important. You know, we talked about the Beatles, you're going to carry that weight, you know, like, or we talked about last week, the band, we were talking about weightlifting, but the weight is such a great song. Take a load off, take a load for free. Like you put the load on me. I just, I just really like that. You know, we're, we're here to help one another and support within these kinds of communities. The last paper I'll speak about was actually referenced. It's referenced like 205 and Vivek's Social Isolation Manifesto. It's a 2015 study by Linton in Sleep Medicine Review called The Effect of the Work Environment on Future Sleep Disturbances, a Systematic Review. This was interesting because it was referred to, it basically said, look, we don't have a lot of scholarship on social support, but we do get glimpses of that when we look at workers and the role that a work environment has on sleep disturbances. And I was mentioning this podcast episode to my wife and she said, oh, like schedules. I was like, yeah, schedules is a huge one. You know, when you're working, you're you're cleaning an office building at night by yourself or a janitor in a, in a high school working nights by themselves. And then they leave. The school is filled with people all interconnected. And then they go home to sleep. So it's not even a, it's a lack of social support in your work environment, but also at home, too. And I'm going to read a little bit from this as well, too. While social support at work, organizational justice 
and control over work were associated with fewer sleep disturbances. The inverse was also found in that decreased control over work and social problems like bullying at work or exclusion at work were associated with increased levels of sleep disturbances and things like insomnia. Taken together, this provides scientific evidence that psychosocial factors impact sleep. In addition, factors included in theoretical conceptions, see that like the effort, reward, and demand control models have received support since imbalances in these factors were related to sleep disturbances. So when you looked at the study, what they found that really impacted workers' sleep were social support at work, control at work. Hey, I need to take a little time because my son's sick, or I need to do this. I, you know, just being able to control your hours really help with people's sleep. Organizational justice. Like I do all the work, yet this person gets all the credit and things that were related to fewer sleep disturbances, high work demands, job strain, bullying and social conflict at work, and effort reward imbalances all predicted future sleep disturbances. And then the author writes, moreover, working a steady shift was associated with disturbances while exiting shift work was associated with less disturbed sleep. So if you were a shift worker, more sleep disturbances, if you just worked the nine to five, less sleep. So I think that we need to consider when we're dealing with insomnia, not just what time do you go to bed? What pills have you been prescribed? What are your beliefs about sleep? What are, I think all those things are important. I'm not diminishing those. But we also maybe need to look a little deeper and a little further in terms of what's going on in your life. You know, I always feel very privileged as a clinician to get that insight with my patients. And I've always felt that there was something magical about being a sleep specialist that really opens people up to tell you about what's going on in their life. I mean, if they're telling you they sleep naked and you know they moan in their sleep or they're like kick their legs or they wet the bed, like once you've talked about bedwetting, what can you not talk about? So I, you know, I really hope that if you're somebody who's struggling with insomnia, that you do look at your schedule. You do look at all the things that we typically talk about. You read my book, The Sleep Solution. You read some other great book like Jade Wu's book, Hello Sleep. But also I want you to take a step back and look at your social connectedness. Do you think it's adequate? If you talk to somebody who's close to you, a relative or a friend and ask them, do you think I get out and do enough. I belong to enough organizations. I'm putting myself out there. I've got enough friend. My, my friend network is big enough to create adequate support. What would they say? Because one thing that you can do that might not cure your insomnia, but maybe start moving you in the right direction is to get involved with something like that. I'm challenging you to go to Trivia Tuesday night as a singlet and just get on somebody's team or bingo night volunteer as a what sports are coming up and you could be a little league umpire you know if you want to, if you're if you're interested in that kind of abuse i mean there's all kinds of ways you could get involved in your community get out to classes we we talked last week about joining a gym you know, even if you're not the most social person, but it's kind of a nice thing. Get out there, join a gym, take some classes, get to know some people. Yeah, you know, I've really enjoyed getting to know people at the gyms I work at. I mean, you see somebody that many times, it's almost rude not to say hello sometimes, you know, even, you know, so putting yourself out there can be a great way to start to get a, come at your insomnia from maybe a very different angle. And we started this episode off with, John Lennon's 1970 album. George Harrison put out an album in 1970 as well, too. And I was recently in Kingston, New York at the restaurant Kinsley. If you're ever in Kingston, New York, go to the restaurant Kinsley. It was practically empty when I was there. I think I got there right as they opened and you know, it was like a lunchtime or something. And 
And they seated me at this beautiful table right next to a fireplace. And above the fireplace was a huge print of the cover of George Harrison's album, All Things Must Pass. And I asked the waitress, this is this kind of a random, why this picture? She said, oh, well, the guy who owns the restaurant is friends with the guy who took the picture. And the guy who took the picture gave it to him as a gift. He said, there's a really funny story. He said, George Harrison bought this big mansion. And he was at the mansion, kind of didn't know what to do. And he was just kind of sitting there on a lawn chair. And the police came up. And they had these garden gnomes and they said, here, these garden gnomes were stolen from the property. They're yours now. And they dropped them and walked away. And the picture on the cover of All Things Must Pass is George Harrison sitting there with these garden gnomes that were recently recovered from the police. And so this guy took a picture and he ended up using it as the cover. So isolation is a tough depressing, bleak song to start the podcast off with. And I've never done this before, but we're going to end the show with some lyrics. And they're actually lyrics from All Things Must Pass, which is just an amazing album. I love It's George Harrison's third studio album after he left the Beatles. And it's, I mean, it's, it's up there. I'm getting chills thinking about some of the songs on it. But anyway, All Things Must Pass is often an overlooked song of the album, even though it's the title track. And I'm going to read you a quick quote to end the show. Now the darkness only stays at nighttime. In the morning, it will fade away. Daylight is good at arriving at the right time, but it's not always going to be this gray. All things must pass. I hope you find some connectedness in your life in 2024. If you're already connected, even more so. I feel connected with you. If you want to connect with me, you can do so through my Twitter account, Dr. Chris Winter, Instagram, Dr. Chris Winter. Thank you for listening. Happy 2024. And until next week, sleep well.